Let's focus for just a minute now on the role of the endocrinologist, uh, specifically in, in these patients. Uh, Nefa, what is the role of the endocrinologist in the treatment of, of radioactive iodine refractory patients? Yeah, so um, I think this is a very important question, and as um, these therapies have emerged and more and more are coming out, it's very important that um, we have this multidisciplinary care um, early on. So, you know, most of these patients with thyroid cancer present first to the endocrinologist. So it's very important um, for the, uh, the endocrinologist to understand radioactive iodine, refractory thyroid cancer, but then also understand these newer drugs and therapies that are coming out. So um, a majority of these patients are still being followed by endocrinologists despite being radioactive iodine refractory under active surveillance. Um, but I think in terms of understanding when do we add cross-sectional imaging, what type of imaging should be done, um, you know, is very important early on. Um, and, you know, Marsha brought up um, several good points in terms of the interaction of the endocrinologist and the medical um, oncologist and when that transition should occur and or when should we uh, uh, be referring or watching together. And, you know, because these patients for many years have been followed by the endocrinologist, I think, uh, the, you know, the patient tends to lean towards the endocrinologist's thought. So it's very important that the endocrinologist understands these drugs, but also refers to the medical oncologist early because if you send them to them just when they need the treatment, then that discussion becomes very hard because this patient has been under watchful waiting for years. Now you're sending them to a new doctor that they don't know who's saying, boom, you need therapy. And they tend not to trust that new doctor and it's, it's, it's not a good dynamic. So involving the medical oncologist early, having the endocrinologist understand these drugs and how to do the cross-sectional imaging. So we work together as a team, similar to what we do every day in interdisciplinary teams and having the surgeon involved. It's a great message. Get, yeah. get your, your team involved early and get the patient comfortable with, with the different members. Manisha? Yeah, so I also, th I agree with NIFA. I also, at least for our team, we rely on endocrinologists to help us manage the TSH suppression, which is critical even when we add systemic, you know, TKI therapy. Uh, especially the TKI therapy tends to cause hypothyroidism, which would be bad for the disease because we always want uh, TSH suppression. So medical oncologists in general don't have great experience, you know, with this delicate balance of synthroid dosing and so forth. And another uh, adverse event that comes with serafinib and some of the other TKIs is hypocalcemia. And interestingly, it's not just often easily remedy because sometimes the diarrhea and other side effects of the kinase inhibitors can prevent just the normal absorption of the of the calcium and we've had some very tricky hypocalcemias and the endocrinologist role continues all the way through between the TSH suppression as Manisha said and sometimes managing the hypocalcemia and other endocrine issues so keeping them a part of the team just as much as a surgeon is very important. Well, you brought up adverse events, and, and that, of course, is going to be a critical factor in deciding which patients to start, when to start. Um, let's try to understand what to expect from these agents. Frank, what are the common adverse events for drugs like serafinib, vandetinib, cabozantinib, et cetera? Right. There's a, there's a whole host of them. Um, and it's important that we talk about those because those are what can alter quality of life. Um, the serafinib, um, primarily it's the hand foot syndrome. Um, and so that's something we talk to patients and, uh, about, and it usually happens within the first cycle. Um, interestingly, uh, with good management, um, we can actually control the symptoms relatively well. Um, I know um, we actually will see the patients oftentimes hold the drug and um, treat aggressively with IV hydration if we need to. We will give them things like non-steroidals. I love Anaprox DS twice daily, uh, regularly, you know, sometimes steroids and urea cream. And then actually when the symptoms resolve, we'll go back to the, the starting dose. We won't necessarily reduce the dose. In some cases we will, depending on the severity, obviously. Um, so that, that's the biggest thing I think we need to manage. You know, diarrhea is another issue as well. You know, Marsha alluded to that. Um, regular aggressive treatments with agents such as loperamide, um, even tincture of opium sometimes can be appropriate. And I think another thing that shouldn't be discounted is the fatigue. The fatigue related to these agents can be um, quite devastating. And I know at it, some points in time, we oftentimes give patients breaks, um, especially if the disease is stable, um, give them a, a small break um, of treatment and just walk, watch them with active surveillance with a CT imaging. And a lot of times the disease will stay stable. So I think those are the, the big ones with that particular drug. Um, with vandetinib, um, similar things can happen, you know, the diarrhea, uh, fatigue. We also have to worry about prolonged QT. 
though um, I can honestly say I've really never seen it in a patient, but it is reported. The important part about that is because the diarrhea um, can lose, uh, lead to loss of electrolytes, we have to monitor the electrolytes accordingly when patients are on vandetinib, um, especially in, um, when they're experiencing um, diarrhea. Um, cabozantinib is a, uh, another agent, too, that can have um, the hand-foot um, syndrome. I had a, a patient, actually, who um, had a very nice response to um, 140 milligrams of cabozantinib, but had extreme, extreme hand-foot syndrome and actually ended up in the hospital. Um, though, again, the response was so great, he didn't want to stop the drug. I'm like, I think we need to stop it just for a little while. <laughs> um, so the important point, I think, about that is that the patients need to be seen like every two weeks up front, and then we can extend the, those visits as they're becoming more tolerant to the symptoms. Thanks, Frank. Let's, let's talk about a specific.